Animal Crossing New Horizons is built on a web of small details that make up an incredible whole. As the fifth main entry in Nintendo's acclaimed Life Sim series, Switch very much takes a working but brilliant formula that goes back to the N64 version, and yet still gives us the biggest leap in its engine work to date. As ever with the Animal Crossing series, the central hook is this idea of a persistent world, putting you in a small community on an idyllic island that changes even while you're not playing. With an in-game clock that syncs to our own, every day brings a new challenge, a new bug to catch, a new item on the store to buy, or blueprint to build something for your house. Certainly the visuals are on the simplistic side on first glance, but look closer and New Horizons offers huge systemic depth that goes well beyond most Switch titles. For those new to the series, the setup is admittedly a bit of a curveball. The characters have buckets of charm, but actual plot content is rather minimal. Rather, it's a game that rewards patience, much like watering a plant every day and slowly seeing the fruits of that labour, seeing your island thrive as the seasons roll by. The initial challenge, at least, is in repaying the loan given by your landlord, Tom Nook. You're invited to start life afresh on an empty island with two other NPCs, with an all-inclusive package that includes flights, accommodation and a phone. You complete tasks around the island for Nook Miles to set your debt, though honestly the real joy of the game is in customising everything to your liking. And then, showing your island off in online play, where you can visit friends in an 8 player instance. So that's the setup. Animal Crossing is entirely unique in Nintendo's lineup for Switch, but underpinning this are some smart technical choices. Firstly, the basics. The game renders at a native 1920x1080 while in docked mode and 1280x720 while in portable, so pretty straightforward there all of which gives us the clearest, most pinpoint sharp presentation possible. Ok, it's hard not to notice that, in true Nintendo style, anti-aliasing is practically absent for New Horizons, so do expect some of those dreaded jagged edges to creep in, but it's still a great looking end result. It also all runs at 30 frames per second, regardless of whether it's docked or not. There are a few frame time blips along the road as I run about online here, but in general, it's a very even-handed level of performance. Perhaps it's a shame to recall previous home console versions. The GameCube port and City Folk on Wii both ran at 60fps, but when you consider the visual upheaval on Switch, which I'll go into later, it's a worthy sacrifice. Official details of New Horizons engine are few and far between, but some light is shed here thanks to the findings of respected data miner Oatmeal Dome. A recent tweet suggests it's based on the same in-house EAD technology as Splatoon 2, ARMS and Mario Maker 2 on an engine codenamed Lunchpack 2. Now these are each likely using variants of this same tech, heavily modified in every case to suit each game's needs but clearly an overlap in in-house rendering technologies for lighting, shaders and materials is very feasible. The tweet also points to Havoc physics being used, which makes sense given the huge catalogue of objects in the game, though in practice, as you'll see, the use of actual physics for gameplay in New Horizons is pretty minimal. What's most striking about the game, especially compared to previous versions, is the slew of visual upgrades that make the most of Switch. Much of this starts with the materials and revamped lighting. Every item of clothing, every bit of furniture, and even characters sport more physically correct reactions to light. The specular highlights are a particular plus, whether that's the shine of Orville's beak as he announces the next outbound flight, or the moonlight glow across garden tables. Even hair benefits. Unlike the flat, unchanging texture map of the N64 version through 3DS versions of Animal Crossing, hair now bounces light realistically based on its position relative to the sun. All of this of course adapts to weather changes and the time of day. Nighttime is marked by the use of lanterns which emanate a beautiful bloom effect, spilling light from your tent onto nearby ground. Most light sources also bounce realistically across your character, and in each case, the type of fabric on each item of clothing reacts a little differently than the last. Roughness, opacity and reflectiveness 
are partly factored in for every cap, t-shirt or dress. It's a huge leap over what came before in the series. Oh, and it's nice to see all of this in effect with a full free camera, limited as it is to just houses, giving full 360 degrees of rotation to see how it all comes together. A few other neat effects make the cut. To go with the ever-changing time of day, a form of atmospheric scattering is also included, affecting light cover from clouds above. Note the way a shadow falling from an object during the day will lose its contrast, blending with the clouds diffuse shadow from high in the sky. The consistency here is what's remarkable. Everything in sight outside is dynamically shaded from source, either the sun or moon in this case. Right down to the small creatures like butterflies, every leaf on a swaying tree gets accurately mapped to the floor. Even ambient occlusion between objects is included here, adding shade that beds each object into the scene more naturally. Looking outside, Animal Crossing's signature bend to its horizon stays in place. There is a limit to how far you can crane that camera down to the ground to see further, but all told, pop-in is never visible as it was sometimes on the DS version. What we have on Switch stays as rigidly fixed in place as ever, and it's perhaps a shame to not see the island from more angles. Then again, it does benefit from new post-process effects to support this view. We've seen bloom and ambient occlusion added, but there's also extensive use of a depth of field unique to this version. It's a simpler Gaussian form of the effect rather than bokeh, but it blends seamlessly with objects in the foreground and distant background to give a more exact sense of 3D space. See how panning inside this room blurs objects closer to the camera, a really neat touch. Everything from the lighting to materials to shadow work and effects all stand out in the context of the series. Even the water rendering tech is impressive with caustics and realistic ripples as it splashes against land. The shader effect kicks in with every landing of bait from a fishing rod and water life splashing around the gorgeous aquarium area too. Again, it's a shame reflections are so limited here. Even mirrors don't show your character. Every element across New Horizons is at least consistent between portable and docked play. So if you're playing on the go, you miss out on no visual details. There is a precedent to what's achieved on Switch, especially looking back to the original. Indeed, a lot of what makes New Horizons so charming is informed by decisions made almost 20 years ago. So, a quick trip down memory lane. The first Animal Crossing released initially in Japan on N64 in 2001. Among the very last games for the system, it was entirely unique for its time, mainly for integrating a real-time clock directly into the N64's gamepad cartridge. It marked it as one of the most technically ambitious games for the system from the outset, though Nintendo had conceived the entire project on the ill-fated 64DD peripheral, where that clock was built into the hardware. The final game also ended up supporting N64's expansion pack, putting the extra 4 megabytes of system memory to use to render at 480p, rather than 240p. Plus, of course, a controller pack allowed for the crucial save game feature. All told, the project tapped into every aspect of the hardware that was available. Sure, it lacked the free camera control to explore its 3D world, something of a defining feature for the likes of Zelda Ocarina of Time or Mario 64. Still, it used the console to achieve a micro-level depth, going beyond most games of its era. The GameCube version, released later that year, did eventually bring it to a wider audience with some enhancements. We had a push to a 60fps target rather than 30fps on N64, plus a new typing interface, integration with Game Boy Advance, numerous object changes, and more collectible games. Otherwise, these two versions were very similar in core visual design, even down to the way areas were partitioned into chunks carried over. In a similar fashion to Zelda A Link to the Past, you'd hit the edge of an area and then the camera would pause for a split second to load in the next segment, and then pan across. It's something that thankfully disappeared with Animal Crossing Wild World on DS in 2005, the follow-up shown here. Jumping forward to 2020, New Horizons clearly revels in its simple but clear visuals. It's a cartoon aesthetic that hasn't changed much between N64, GameCube, and even DS, Wii, and 3DS retained that drive for charm over realism. 
This is held up in Spirit on Switch, which despite a raft of visual upgrades on a new overhauled engine, keeps its base visuals, the repeated trees and basic character models in step with earlier games. Funnily enough, even the dialogue sound effects are close to the N64 version's auto-generated vocals. Likely, this was informed by the limited space on N64's cartridge for actual pre-recorded dialogue. But still, it's a design choice that had charm, and continues to do so on Switch. The focus of Animal Crossing sets it apart from Nintendo's other work. The branching dialogue trees, countless thousands of items, and unique timed events make it hard to do justice when pulling it apart purely based on its visuals. The breadth of things you can do in New Horizons, the way it blossoms over time to a real-time clock, makes it one of Switch's standout games, and well worth checking out if you're looking for a change of pace. That the series' DNA can be traced all the way back to the N64 and GameCube originals, which both hold up to this day, is really a testament to the resilience of a great core idea, an idea that's only grown more refined with every version. But that's all from me today. I hope you found this one useful or insightful in any way. And if you did, feel free to like or subscribe. And don't forget to hit the bell to get notifications as any new video lands. To get a high quality version of this video, check out our Patreon at digitalfoundry.net. And to get in touch with me or the team, just use Twitter. But from me for now, thanks for watching.